Greetings, my sisters and brothers, and welcome back to Letters from Tarsus, uh, where yesterday we started a journey through Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. Now, if you haven't already checked out the first part, then I suggest you go back and have a look at that, because today we're going to start delving a little bit deeper into this world-shaking letter that Paul wrote in response to the issues that he had been told were starting to cause serious problems in the churches that he planted in Asia Minor during his missionary journey through that province. Issues of division, tribalism, the marginalisation of some members of the church, people questioning who's in and who's out, who's righteous and who's not. And on the day that America goes to the polls to elect their leader, and the day before we here in the UK go back into a full lockdown in another attempt to try and get some control of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has quite literally changed the way we live and worship, it seems poignant for us to make some space and consider how Paul sought to resolve exactly the same kind of issues that are raging all around us here today. So Galatians 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of God, our Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, when you start to think and examine Paul's letters, what becomes pretty clear quite quickly is just how big his view of the gospel is. Sparrow, what do you mean how big the gospel is? I mean just how much God was able to achieve in and through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. As an example of what I'm talking about, just listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 1 verses 7 to 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So yes, through the blood of Jesus shed at Calvary, we have received forgiveness for our sins, but there is so much more. God had a far grander and universal purpose than cleaning up the mess that humanity had made. God was willing something to happen, something which he achieved now and in the age to come. Paul says in his opening to this letter to the Galatians that the forgiveness of our sins delivers us from this present evil age. But to where? Now I know as Christians our minds automatically jump to this rather strange and quite abstract concept that's called heaven. But whatever we may have been brought up to believe... The idea of being a disembodied spirit floating around in some ethereal dimension separated from the earth is not the final expectation that the Bible describes for the people of God. What the Bible describes at the end of the book of Revelations is that God is going to unite all things in a new heaven and a new earth, and the people of God will dwell together with their God forever. The picture is of unity. God brings about the most perfect and beautiful reality where all things have been unified, restored, united. This is what Paul believes has and is occurring in and through the manifestation of God's spirit upon the earth, the place where heaven and earth meets, the temple of the Holy Spirit, or in shorthand, the church. You know, Paul is mad at the Galatian church. He's angry that they've been so stupid to allow themselves to be taken in by a bunch of false teachers and smart suit wearing smooth talking preachers who have fed them lies and fake news about the message of the gospel and have tried to influence them against not only the teachings of Paul but against Paul himself. These people were trying to cause division, trying to drive in a wedge and cause people to start thinking in tribal terms about them and us. Righteous, unrighteous, labour, Tory, lockdown, don't lockdown, leave, remain, Democrat, Republican, Android, Apple, red, blue, whatever it is, it is the antithesis of what God was doing and what Paul's gospel was announcing. And so at the same time, 
that Paul disagrees in the clearest and most visceral way with what was going on within the Galatian church in this letter and knowing the scolding he's about to give them. How does Paul begin this letter? What is his attitude towards this group of people who he could have been so offended at that he could have cancelled and could have rejected out of hand? He begins by wishing the church grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the highest blessing that be, can be bestowed upon anyone. So what is Paul saying? He's saying that no matter what, we are one body. One church, indivisible, because what God has brought together, no human being can divide. Paul is saying that even though we may disagree, even though we may have the most fundamental disputes over how things are done or what our political affiliations are, or whether we should conform to the lockdown or continue to meet and express our faith in a group setting, whatever the dispute, we are still united. We are still one and a house divided against itself cannot stand. He will not allow these issues to turn his heart against the church because Paul knows that any of these issues that would seek to divide us are born out of one place and that is fear. And he knows that the only vaccine to fear is love. So today, as America goes to the polls to elect who is going to be their president for the next four years. As we face the prospect of another four-week lockdown, or however long it lasts, as we face the potential for social unrest and the breakdown of our society, let us not be divided by fear and driven into tribal thinking. Let us be united and motivated by love. Love for our fellow human beings, love for our saviour and love for our God. We don't have to agree about everything to be united because the source of our unity was not achieved through the political systems or the legislation of our governments, but through the atoning death and unconditional love of our saviour. And no matter who your president is or who your leader is, Jesus is your king and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. May you know his grace and peace. Amen.